Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? So what notable thing is happening two days from now? An exam. Okay, so any questions about that? Yes? You could do you could do zero, that'd be fine. Oh, you mean like like yeah. like carryover minutes <laughs> or whatever? <laughs> no, it, it's 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 you have to spend these or not on the midterm, and then you'll have another batch that you can spend or not on the final. Okay. You have a question? So is it five or eight? That's five. I, I'm sure it says eight or something in, in e-learning, but that's not right. <laughs> yes? So in addition to the um, exam next time, there's also a quiz this week? Ah, that's the second thing, is that we're not going to have a quiz this week because I want you to study for the exam. Yes? <laughs> yes? Uh, I'm excited from the number of times we're requesting the quiz. Three. Three. Yes? So it'll be three questions and then a bunch of questions which are similar but relate to the questions that were on the previous quiz. The way it'll be is that there will be a, it, it will be just like I passed out an exam that has three qu questions on it. So you'll, you'll do this. Uh, and then uh, when, when you've thought enough about those three questions then you can come and make five selections from the front. And then you take those back to your seat. You can continue looking at the three and the five. Uh, but when it's over, it, it's over. Yes? Comparable to the quiz questions, yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, I saw that you posted the keys to the quizzes yes. as well as our grades. Are you also going to post like, the scans of our quizzes that we did? They, they are, are posted. posted. They are? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the if you look at the place where you download the written homeworks, you click on a link called blanks. There's also a link called scan or something like that. And that's that's where your that's where yours are. Each of you individually. Other questions? Okay, so let's get to it. So last time we talked about the inverse function theorem. So, oh, it's not even on. can't zoom out until it finishes. There, there we go. Okay. So today's the 24th. Last time we talked about the inverse function theorem. The inverse function theorem was uh, the following. was that if you have uh, let u, a subset of Rn, be open, suppose that we have f from u to Rn, so no notably f is taking an open subset of u which, uh, an sorry, an open subset uh, U of Rn to Rn. So this, this function signature, it takes vectors of n components to vectors of n components, so it's the same, like 2 to 2, 3 to 3, this kind of thing. <coughs> so let this be open. Uh, and then what was the name of the point that we put in the set? So I can do the same one again. Was it A? It sounds like, I think I'd probably do A. Uh, A a point in U, uh, F 
uh, df evaluated at a uh, exists and uh, injective. Okay, so now what I what I mean by that is that the derivative of that function at a uh, when you consider it as a linear map it's injective. Now because it's from Rn to Rn that also means it's what? Bijective. Bijective. It also, it, besides being injective when, when, it, when you take a linear map and represent it as a matrix this would be a n by n matrix and in such a case injective is equivalent to surjective is equivalent to bijective. So as a result of it of it, of it being bijective, that means that we can, it's possible to invert the linear map. So you can take the, li you can go backwards with the linear map. The inverse function theorem says you can do even better. You can do even better. You can even take the curvy bit and also take it backwards. So, specifically, something like this. <coughs> uh, then, there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that uh, <coughs> such that uh, how, do, how do I want to say it? Such that F is locally invertible on the ball of radius epsilon centered at F of A. So why do I have to say the ball of radius, why, why am I saying the ball of radius epsilon centered at f of a, and not a? Right, so then, so what we're saying is that, <coughs> is something like, the best I can do is draw something like this. So this function that I'm drawing is it is it an invertible function? It is not. It's not an invertible function because uh, if if you if you construe this as being like a college algebra function, like a cubic or something, then it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Okay. Alternatively, it's not injective because if you were to witness the output zero, then according to what's drawn, there's at least three inputs, one, two, three, which could produce the output zero. So you couldn't, you couldn't reverse this function as a machine. But uh, say right here, for this input, A, uh, what we're saying is that suppose, that, suppose that the function is differentiable at that input. That is to say, suppose that uh, the function is locally flat there. <coughs> then we could take the output over here, f of a, and then there, there is <coughs> a, uh, an open set. So I have to say, I'm saying open set, uh, because even though I drew this as if it's uh, on the plane, do understand that this is a copy of Rn, <laughs> and this is another copy of Rn. So when I draw an open interval here, what I really mean is an open set. So this is the ball of radius epsilon centered at f of a, And so now you can take uh, this function and just take this part of it. So just the red part that I cut out right there, uh, ignoring all the rest of the red parts, is that red part injective? It is. It's invertible. So what, what the inverse function theorem is saying is that if locally, locally, the local linear approximation of the function is invertible, then so is the function itself locally to that, local to that point. Maybe not, maybe not uh, if you get too far away, 
but locally it will be. Okay, good. So any question about this? So really what, yes? So what, why exactly does it need to be f of a and not a? Because uh, what we're saying is that there exists a g which is from the ball of radius epsilon at f of a to Rn. So g is going instead of from instead of from these inputs to, to outputs, it's going from outputs to inputs. Uh, there exists a g such that uh, f composed with g is the identity function and also g composed with f is the identity function, but only, only on, uh, on the on appropriate sets. Okay, not the whole thing. <clears throat> so what this is saying, uh, this is just another restatement of that if a if if a function is differentiable at a point, then the derivative there is a good estimate of its behavior there locally. So if if uh, the function has, has uh, an invertible derivative there, then locally that function should be invertible. Okay, good. So any question about this theorem? Okay, so now let's solve another linear, uh, linear problem. So here's an example. So consider the function t of x, y, and z is, uh, say, 1, 2, 3, x, y, z. OK. So what's the signature of t? What kind of inputs does it, does it take? R3. And what kind of output does it produce? R. R. So take a, take a three-dimensional uh, input, produce a one-dimensional output. OK. Uh, so now, let's consider further. Let's find the kernel of t, or if you like, the null space of t. Well, that means that we want to solve the equation 1, 2, 3, x, y, z is equal to 0, but what kind of 0? Zero? 0, 0 scalar, right? Because that's the kind of output that, that t produces. So a, a couple comments. Uh, so that's a matrix. Approximately how many operations would it take to put it in reduced or echelon form? Zero. zero. <laughs> Why would it take zero operations to put it in reduced row echelon form? It's already in reduced row echelon form, right? So to get something in reduced row echelon form, what you're trying to do is, is get uh, pivot, it, pivotal ones. If you had one for each row, if you had a pivotal one for each row, that would mean that that, uh, that matrix is what? Surjective. It would mean surjective. So we do have a pivotal one. It's right there. It's already a one. If, if, if I were to change that to a five, say, if I were to change this one to a five, then how many operations and what operation would take to put it in reduced row echelon form? Right, one, one operation, and, we, and it could be done by multiplication by a fifth. Okay, good. So here's a, here's a pivotal one. And because there's one row, and because we have that pivotal one, that means that, that, means that uh, t is surjective. So that means that for any, for any real output, there's some input that would produce it. So for example, if you said, well, can you make 2451? And the answer is, 
Yeah, you can. So some three-dimensional input will become 20, will become the output 2451. Okay, so if we were to multiply this out, uh, the result would be uh, what? X plus 2Y plus 3Z is zero. So what kind of, what kind of uh, object is this, if you were to plot it? It's a plane. It's a plane. Uh, and in particular, it's going through the origin. Okay, so uh, what I want you to see is that we have the input is in R3. So this is X, Y, Z. And then T goes over here and maps to the reals. And I'm not, real in, I'm not interested in what, it, what, what becomes of the image of T. What I'm interested in is what T leaves behind. Yes? Hey, um, so, it's probably a dumb question. No dumb why questions. Is, why is T surjective? Um, T is surjective be, uh, because, so a, a, a linear function is surjective uh, when, you can, when you span the codomain, yes when you span the whole thing. And you can tell that numerically when, if you take, if you take uh, a linear function and you find its matrix, and here's, here's its matrix, I gave it to you, its matrix, and then if you take its matrix and put it into to reduced row echelon form, count up the number of pivotal ones, and if the number of pivotal ones is the same as the number of rows, if you have one for each row, then, then it's surjective. So how many rows do we have? And how many pivotal ones? One. So it's surjective. So I'm not interested in what, what happens over here. Uh, this is the image. I'm interested in what's left over here. That is to say, the kernel. So the kernel is this plane right here. OK. So uh, let's see if I can draw it. <laughs> so when z, when z is 0, That is to say, on the xy plane, uh, if we were to solve for y, so if z is 0, and then solve for y, what is, what is the solution? y is negative half x. Uh, so y is negative half x. So I'll draw that uh, in here. So since this is the xy plane, it might help if I draw it like that so that it looks a little bit more uh, usual. So this is x going this way, y going this way, y is negative half x. So from here, uh, as x increases, y decreases a little bit. And then like that. So that's a line that is sitting inside of the xy plane. Yeah, that line is sitting inside of the xy plane. And when, <coughs> when z is 1, where is z? Uh, what is z equal to 1 in this drawing? Do you have a question? Maybe. So this is the x-axis coming this way. And that's the y-axis. So it should be as x increases, y decreases. So x is coming out of the page? x comes out of the page. So what is, what is z is equal to 1? What does it look like? Right, it's the xy plane shifted up one position. So in that case, if, if z is 1, then, then the equation looks like x plus 2y plus 3 is 0. And if we solve for y, uh, that, would, that would give what? y is negative half x minus 3 halves. So that would mean that uh, when, you go, when you go up, when you go up, the line shifts down, shifts in the negative y direction. So that means that uh, this, this red line is where this plane intersects the xy plane, and then it goes up this way, like this. And then down under the xy plane that way. 
So it's hard to draw perspective, and I'm no artist, but we have this red plane, and it's hitting the XY plane right there, and then goes under, and it, it goes all the way that way. So this is the, this is the kernel over here. And what I want you to uh, see is that because, because only x is pivotal and y and z are non-pivotal, so it, is that the adjectives that were used in your linear algebra class, pivotal and non-pivotal? Free and basic. Yeah. Free and basic? Okay, so, so is free variable the name for these ones? Okay, so what, what this is saying is that as a result, you can solve for x in terms of y and z. You can solve for x in terms of y and z. So then let's, let's do that. We take this equation. Can you solve for x? <laughs> okay, it's not a very tall order. Okay. So x is uh, negative 2y minus 3z. So... solve uh, for, and what kind of variable is x called? If these are free, is this one non-free? Uh, basic. basic? Are we in agreement? Okay. Uh, solve for basic in terms, that's kind of weird, isn't it? In terms of free. Okay, good. I mean, I think it's because, like, um, you said, like, this x, like, part of the basis for the like, column of x, like, part of the basis. Okay, that, okay, now that makes more sense. <laughs> Basic, like, like basis. Okay. <clears throat> so let's try another one. <clears throat> so for example, how about t of x, y, and z? is now given by <coughs> 1, 2, negative 1 in the first row, and how about 0, 0, 1 in the second row, x, y, z. So what's the signature of t then? Yes? Uh, I had a question about what we were just did. Yes? What I, want you, what I want you to observe currently is that I want you to think of it like the null space is what the linear transformation leaves behind, in a sense. So then this over here, this null space, it is possible to solve for the basic variables in terms of the free variables. So you can represent the kernel, uh, and the kernel is two-dimensional. Okay, and uh, for this one, what's the signature of, of this T? So what kind of inputs? R3, what kind of outputs? R2. So it's similar to the previous one, except, uh, well, I increased the dimension of the output. Uh, further, furthermore, uh, I didn't have to give you a row reduced a reduced row echelon form matrix, but I did just for to, to expedite things. So how many pivotal ones are there? Two, and, and in which columns are they? One and three, right? So these are, these are the pivotal ones. <laughs> so these are the pivotal ones. Uh, now, if you'll recall when we were talking about when we were talking about kernel before, we, we did an operation where we said, well, let's, um, let's uh, when, when we're trying to solve for the kernel, let's permute the columns and also the variables so that all of the pivotal ones are furthest to the left. So that is to say, uh, notice that uh, not all the pivotal columns are to the left. This one is, is to the right, so we're going to end up permuting these. And because we're going to permute these columns, we're going to also end up permuting uh, the rows in the, in, the, in the variables. So specifically, what I want you to observe is that this equation, 1, 2, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 
multiplied by x, y, z is equal to 0. So what kind of 0 do I need to write here? So this one, right? So specifically, I'm going to permute these two columns. And as a result, to keep, to keep the system the same, what else besides permuting these two columns, what must I do? Permute these two rows. <clears throat> so I'll, per I'll do that and obtain the system uh, 1, 0, negative 1, 1, 2, 0, and then x, z, y still equal to 0, 0. Notice that I also permuted the zeros. <laughs> okay. <laughs> less, less funny than I had hoped. <clears throat> so notice that the pivotal ones are now all collected to the left. And that these, <laughs> I, got, I got one <laughs> delayed. That's fine. So then these, these two uh, are basic. These two are basic. And this one is free. So the operation of, of, of this permutation, yes? We wouldn't actually permute the output here, right? Because we don't know which ones. We only have two, whereas we permuted three. In reference to your joke, we only have two permutations. I agree. I agree. Okay. It, was just, it, was just a, it was just a bad joke. <laughs> okay, so th this, this system is exactly the same as the other one. It's exactly the same as the other one. Uh, but uh, now we have all of the, all of the basic variables on, on the top and all of the free variables uh, on the bottom. Okay. <clears throat> so now, uh, while, while we consider that, I'd like for you to observe, if you were to multiply this out, if you were to multiply it out, it would really correspond to two equations. It would be two separate equations, two, two scalar equations. So specifically, the equation would be uh, x minus z plus 2y is 0. And what would the other equation be? Z. Just z is equal to 0. <clears throat> OK, now, this is a plane, and that is a plane. And I gave you a problem where the matrix was already re reduced row echelon form, which is why this last equation is so simple. But in principle, I could have given you any six numbers here. Okay, so this is a, this is a plane. That's a plane. So we need both of these equations to be true at the same time. The first one represents a plane. The second one represents a plane. Geometrically, what does it mean for both of these equations to be true at the same time? the intersection of these two planes. So this, this equation you could imagine uh, as signifying being on this red plane, say. So that's that one. And then z equal to 0, that's some other plane. Of course, we know it's exactly the xy plane. But do understand that generally it's just some plane. <coughs> So then, you could be on the red plane, you could be on the green plane, and to be on both means to be where? On this line. Okay? So, <clears throat> what, I'm, what I'm telling you is that this blue line right here is the kernel. Because it's saying that, well, to be in the kernel means that you have to be on the, on the green and also the red. So to be on both is to be in the blue. So now, what we're saying is that we should be able to solve for x and z both in terms of what? In terms of y. 
So we should be able to do both. Let's verify that we can do that. <coughs> so solve for <coughs> x and z in terms of y. Well, z is pretty easy. Okay, so then uh, z, what's the solution for z? <laughs> Zero. Okay, x is marginally more complicated. So x we could write as uh, z minus 2y. So now currently x is in terms of z and y, but how can we, so how can we fix that? Well, z is 0, right? So this is just negative 2y. <clears throat> so what we're saying is that we have, we have uh, a function which takes a y and outputs an x and a z. Uh, the x is negative 2y, and the z is 0. That's interesting. So one-dimensional input, uh, two-dimensional output. Okay, so that's the, that's solving for uh, solving for x and z in terms of y. Any question about this? <clears throat> yes. So what is, is the purpose of permutating the columns and rows? Like, what is it? You just it's all in order because you can still solve for. Yeah, so you could you could still do it in principle, but what but the reason why why we're doing it this way is because I want you to I want you to have the um, imagination that uh, we're collecting in a sense the invert the invertible part of this matrix uh, over here on the left in a block. Because for this this is in reduced row echelon form, but you could you could take this even further because you have two uh, because you have two rows and two pivotal, pivotal ones, you could do some further row operations and get that to be a zero so that this would be the identity. Okay, good. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, do we need to do one more of these? Nah, probably not. <clears throat> so, when you have a linear map, from Rn to Rn minus k, you can always, uh, you can, and, and if this map is surjective, then uh, you can always solve for, for some of the variables in the kernel in terms of other variables in the kernel, okay, using that block formula that, that we've been talking about and, and what those two were specific examples of. So now I want you to consider a different example. How about this set? So specifically, this is the unit circle. So is, is, the, is the unit circle uh, a subspace, <laughs> a linear subspace? No, right? No, it's not homogeneous. It's not additive. So there's no linear function that would have this as its kernel, right? Uh, is there any function at all that could have this as its kernel? And so now I have to scare quote kernel because kernel and null space really are only defined for, uh, for linear functions. So that is to say, is there some function that if you were to solve for where that function is zero, you'd get that? Sorry? Yes, but I'm, I'm going to not go that direction. Ah, so let's consider. <coughs> consider the function f of x and y is equal to x squared plus y squared minus 1. So is this function, is this function linear? No, that's not linear. Uh, it, is ne it is neither additive nor homogeneous. So it's, ne it's neither one of these. But what I want you to observe, <coughs> then, the solution to f of x and y equal to 0 
The solution set is what? <coughs> is exactly that, that red bit. <coughs> Furthermore, I'd like for you to consider this, uh, this space and imagine that you're a little creature on it. Notice that no matter where you are on, on the surface, uh, it is locally flat. I don't mean, and understand that, I don't mean horizontal, I mean flat. So for example, right there, locally flat. Even on, even on the, the side over here, that is also locally flat. Okay, everywhere, it's locally flat. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, let's consider for a moment. What is the derivative uh, what is the derivative of big F evaluated at X and Y? Two X, two Y. 2x in the first column, 2y in the second column. Okay. I'd like for you to consider specific, uh, some specific points. <coughs> uh, how about df evaluated at 1, 0, and also uh, df evaluated at 0, 1. Okay, so, so at 1, 0, it's 2 and 0. And at 0, 1, it's 0 and 2. And then everywhere else on the red circle, <coughs> notice that the only way you could get either one of those to be zero is if the other one was not zero, to be on the circle anyway. Why can't they both be zero? Yeah, because, right, zero, zero, the origin is not on the circle. The only way, when one of them is, is zero, the other one simply cannot be zero. So, <coughs> Generally, if we were to evaluate df at some point AB that's on the circle, then this would be 2A, 2B, like so, and then uh, we, could <coughs> we could consider, say, df AB and then apply it to some values, say h and k, uh, that would be what? 2ah plus 2bk. And if we, were to at, if we were to solve for when this is 0, and suppose we want to solve for h, when can you solve for h? Under what circumstance? When a isn't zero. Okay, if a was, if a were zero, then you wouldn't be able to perform the division, and you wouldn't be able to proceed. Uh, similarly, when can you solve for k? When b is non-zero. So, when a is non-zero, where is that on, on the circle? Uh, when, you, when you're not on the uh, vertical axis, right? So, uh, I've got it too. It just barely won't fit. Okay, so when, I asked when can you solve for H, when can you solve for K?
when b is non-zero, <coughs> So when can you solve for when can you solve for h anywhere except where on on the picture <clears throat> everywhere except the north every everywhere except the north and south pole <clears throat> okay so look what happens at the at the north pole the tangent is horizontal so my question is, is can you, solve, uh, can you solve for x in terms of y? Uh, you can't, right? Or can you? Do I have it backwards? <coughs> well, let me, let me be very simple and ask. Supposing that this is now college algebra and this is oriented the right way, is the green a function? That isn't one, right? Because vertical lines aren't functions. Similarly, this pole over here is not a function. Okay. <clears throat> so let's consider another example. So I have a question. Uh, what is the equation for a cylinder in R3? So let's have a look at one. So what I mean is something like something like this. So how can we come up with, with an equation for, for such a cylinder? So it's x squared plus y squared, and then we need, uh, you, we need to give it a radius. So like x squared plus y squared is 1, say, because 1 is a nice radius. Uh, and then no dependence on z, which means that it, it goes all the way up and all the way down. So this, this red could be x squared plus y squared is 1, say. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> and for a different, for a different plane, for, for a different surface, I could say, how about consider the equation of a plane? So how about this particular plane? I'll just write its formula since I couldn't possibly draw it very well. x uh, plus 2y plus 3z is equal to 4. So this is a plane. Uh, does this plane go through the origin? It doesn't, right? How can you tell it does not go through the origin? Very good. Plug in 0, the equation is false. OK. So now suppose that we're going to satisfy both of these equations at the same time. We're going to satisfy the, the equation for the cylinder and also the equation for the plane. Then what will the result look like if you satisfy both? It'll be some kind of an ellipse. In particular, uh, we've got this cylinder right here, and then this plane is somehow slanted in all directions. Okay, so it'll be like we take the cylinder and then we cut it uh, at an angle. So how about if we have both? So the result might look something like this. Thank you. 
So to satisfy both equations is to be not just on the red, not just on the green, but on this blue where you happen to be on both. <coughs> OK. So can we come up with an equation, an equation whose solution equal to 0 is that, is that blue ellipse? So how can we do it? Mm -hmm. Move the right side over and say that they both, both must be true. Very good. So uh, this, the ellipse, is uh, the solution to f of x, y, and z. So first we'll write the function. So the first coordinate I'll give is the cylinder coordinate. So x squared plus y squared minus 1. And then the second uh, one we'll give is the, the plane. So x plus 2y plus 3z minus 4. So here's this function. Then we'll say it's the solution to this equation. f of x, y, and z is 0. And what kind of 0? 0, 0, right? This one. So for, for the first one to be true, that means be on the cylinder. For the second one to be true, it means be on the plane. For both to be true, it means, well, it means be on that ellipse there that you can see. So what I want you to observe <coughs> And what I want you to think about, <coughs> well, let's compute the derivative of this function <coughs> first. So what's its, uh, its derivative? In the first place, what, what will be the uh, rows and columns of its derivative? Three columns, two rows. Why will the, so columns are always in correspondence to what? The number of variables, right? So that means that the first, the first column will be derivative with respect to first variable, second column derivative with respect to second variable, et cetera. And then for every row of the output, there'll be a row uh, in the derivative. <coughs> so. What will it be? It'll be 2x, and then 1, and 2y, and 2, and then 0, and 3. Good. So any question about this? OK. So now I have a question for you. Let's consider that we're on the ellipse. If we're on the ellipse, then <coughs> is, uh, is df evaluated at x, y, z surjective? OK, that is to say, suppose that we take a specific x, y, and z, uh, would, it, would it be surjective? For example, let's consider df evaluated at, say, 0, 0, 0. That is to say, let's plug in, let's plug in zeros for all the variables. Uh, that would give the matrix 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, is this matrix surjective? No, it's not surjective. Uh, how can you tell it's not surjective? It has, well, it has a row of zeros, so that's a good, uh, a good indicator. Uh, another th way to say it is that it has just one pivotal one, but in order to be surjective, how many pivotal ones would we need? We'd need two of them. Uh, so, so notice that this one is not surjective. Mm -hmm. 
But does that have any bearing on my original question? I said, suppose we're on the ellipse, then, then is, this, is this matrix surjective? So does this observation have any bearing? No. Because let's consider, what, is 0, 0, 0 on the blue ellipse? No. It isn't, right? 0, 0, 0 is, well, it's just not on the ellipse. How can you tell it's not? It doesn't satisfy. It's not on the plane, for one thing. It's not on the cylinder either, right? It, e, e, just one of them would be enough, right? But, but it's not on either one. So what, how can we answer the question here? <coughs> So here's this matrix. Yes? So the first row would have to be all zeros. So we can assume that x and y are zero and see if anything is satisfying that as well. Okay, good. So so I'll I'll say it like this. Suppose suppose that we have the case that x is zero. Suppose that. If x is zero, then what must be true about y? Are we running out of time? No, we're not. <laughs> uh, well, then what? Then y should be plus or minus one. Okay, so if x is zero, that that would mean that uh, that we we could get a zero here. Okay. Then what if y is zero? Then x must be non-zero, plus or minus one. So very good. So. I like what you said. You could, you could say that, uh, in a sense, the only way, uh, hmm. I'll, I'll just leave it as, I'll leave it nebulous, because I, I don't want to get bogged down in too much, too much algebra. But what I want you to observe is that, and, and hopefully intuit is what I really mean, is that this, uh, this, this matrix is surjective on the ellipse. It's not surjective for every value of x, y, and z, but it is surjective on the ellipse. So now here's what I want to convince you of. Let's consider these two examples. So we looked at two examples. One of them was this circle. So is this circle a function? It's not a function, right? It's not a, you, you cannot express y as a function of x or x as a function of y. However, what I would like you to observe is that if you were right here, say, if you were right there near that point, then you would be able to express x as a function of y or y as a function of x. You could do it there. Okay, how about, uh, how about right here? So locally, you cannot express this uh, y as a function of x, right? You can't do y as a function of x. But can you do x as a function of y? Yeah, yeah you can, which is to say that in the college algebra sense, this green line is not a function, but that one is in the college algebra sense. Similarly, if you take the red and you cut out a piece near that attachment, say just that piece. If we look at just that piece, then you can't express y as a function of x, but you can express x as a function of y near that point. Similar things about the North Pole, okay, but with the variables reversed. Here, you could, Gesundheit, you could express x as a function of y or y as a function of x near that point. <clears throat> and for the cylinder,
<clears throat> for the cylinder. You're uh, locally always going to be able to express one variable in terms of the other two <coughs> because now there's, uh, there's no way that we could get uh, close to uh, a bad point. That is to say that where uh, <laughs> one of these. So now, now we need to be precise. So the idea is that this red circle and this blue ellipse, they're not functions, but locally they can be uh, considered as functions. So such functions are called implied functions, and this theorem is the implicit function theorem. So theorem. So let U, a subset of Rn, open, A, an element of U, function F, big F, from U to Rn minus K. So notably, what I want you to observe is that therefore F takes inputs of n components and produces outputs of n minus k components. That is to say that it's like you're putting in things of dimension higher than the outputs. So like R5 to R3 or R5 to R1 or something like that. Yes? Does this include the stipulation that k is greater than zero? Yes. <laughs> well, mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that, but, but just so you have a real good map of the territory, when k, when k is zero, this, this is more or less exactly the inverse function theorem. <coughs> okay, so let uh, this be C1. So that means that all of its partials, uh, all of its partials exist, and furthermore, what's true about the partials? They're continuous, right? The first I'm sorry? The first right, the first, the, all the first partials are, are continuous. Okay. Uh, suppose that uh, the set, uh, what am I trying to say? Suppose F evaluated at A is zero and the derivative of f evaluated at a is surjective. Is surjective. <clears throat> then What does that mean about this matrix? So let, let's think about it for a minute. So that would mean that then the matrix uh, with an X in the matrix df evaluated at a so first off what's its shape how many rows and columns right n minus k by n so that's how many rows so how many pivotal ones must it have okay so it has uh, n minus k 
pivotal ones. Pivotal ones. So that means that, uh, so that's what, that's what surjectivity means. So now I want you to imagine. Imagine that we had, uh, we had this matrix. Okay, we, could, we actually computed it. And suppose that for every row, there's a pivotal one. Now we could take all those columns and do what? We could sort them to the left side. Okay, but while, while sorting them, you also need to sort the variables. Okay, because if you sort just the columns and leave the variables alone, then, then you've messed everything up. So what I want you to imagine is that we've already done that. Suppose we've already, the variables were already sorted, we just got super lucky, and all the pivotal ones were in the first n minus k columns. So specifically, suppose that df evaluated at a has the following block structure that all of the pivotal part is there on the left and the non-pivotal part is on the right. <coughs> so that means that as far as the basic and free variables, where are the basic variables? They're all on the basic variables. They're on the they're on the top, right? Because if, if we consider uh, the the variables which I haven't written here, okay, that means that all the basic ones correspond to the pivotal ones. So all of them are on the top, and all the free variables are on the bottom, right? So specifically, uh, we could take uh, the what am I trying to say? So the solution df a of z is equal to zero can be fa can be further factored in this way to the pivotal part, the non-pivotal part, the basic part, the free part, equal to zero. And then this is exactly that equation that we did one or two lectures ago. So do you observe that because, bec what must be true about P since this matrix is surjective? P must be invertible. So P is, in fact, an invertible matrix. And we would be able to solve for Y in terms of X. And what's the solution for Y in terms of X? In terms of P and N. Right, so do you remember that in block structure, this is PY plus NX is zero because these block matrices and block vectors multiply just like matrices do, then we can solve for y and get negative p inverse in x. And again, to, to, to stress it, hopefully not too hard, why is it that we can compute p inverse? Because the matrix was surjective. So, so what I want you to see is that locally, linearly, local linearly, you can solve for, you can solve for some of the variables in terms of the other ones. So what I want you to take away from that and what the, what the, what the conclusion of the theorem is is that, well, not only can you do it linearly, but you can also do it nonlinearly, yes? Right here, these are n minus k. Uh, and these, there's k of these. Uh, because remember that p is uh, n minus k by n minus k. 
okay? <clears throat> Too many Ks. So then, so then, the implicit function theorem says, then locally, uh, there exists a function g, which is Uh, which, uh, for which, y is g of x. <clears throat> okay, so now to draw a picture. And the best I can do is draw a two-dimensional picture. This is altogether a complicated way to say the following. Is the circle a function? It's not a function. Choose a point. OK, and then look at the tangent line. Notice that uh, because, because this tangent line has slope, that means that, uh, that the map from R2 to R is surjective, the fact that it has slope, okay, a non-zero slope, I mean to say. So you could cut out near that point a piece of the circle, say that piece. So now if you cut out just that piece of the circle, do you notice that just that piece of the circle is a function, locally? <clears throat> Very good. So any question about the statement of the implicit function theorem? And that function yes. is y, right? Or g of x, right? Yes, a function g. And uh, because, because, because it's sloped in both directions, that means that you could solve it either way. You could solve it as x is a function of y or y as a function of x. Okay, but at the north pole, say, you could only do y as a function of x but not the other way around. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, is there anything specifically in here I want to do? <clears throat> okay, good. Ah, we're out of time. Okay, so the thing I want to leave you with, <clears throat> just so it can be stewing in your head, uh, is the following kind of idea. So, as a subset of the plane, you can draw some nice looking thing here. So is this a function? Y is a function of X or X is a function of Y? It's not. However, if you can imagine being a little bitty creature walking around on it, little, little bitty in comparison to it, then locally to you, it would always look like a function because all these bits that we can see from our, from our global point of view, uh, the little creature can't see. So if you were to cut out any little piece As long as that piece is small enough, then locally you could, you could represent this piece as a function. Okay, and, and furthermore, you'll always be able to do that, some variables in terms of the others, as long as, more or less, the derivative there exists and is surjective. Okay, good. So, see you, uh, see you next time for the exam.